Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the talk titled Why Menopause uh, is a Workplace Issue, which is facilitated today through Gendered Organizational Practice Research Cluster at the Open University, um, GOP for short. My name is Nella Smolovich Jones. I'm director of GOP and I will be your host today. And for those of you unfamiliar with this research cluster, I should say that uh, uh, it provides a space in which all those uh, dedicated to gender equality can uh, share insights from academic study and practice. And this is exactly what we're going to do today. So um, before I introduce our fabulous speaker for today, uh, please note the Q&A pane on your right. This is where you can type in your questions. Uh, this is where you also can vote for your questions uh, by simply clicking like button next to it. And please take advantage of, of this facility because then I can prioritize those questions that you prefer in Q&A. Um, you're also probably uh, familiar with events such as these. Um, so, um, you know, you already probably know that that uh, session is going to be recorded, but I am obliged to say that it will be recorded for f for uh, future use. So uh, to the more fun stuff, um, our speaker today is brilliant Jo Bruce. Uh, she's a professor of uh, people and organizations at the Open University, whose research, broadly speaking, focuses on uh, bodies at work or embodied experiences at work. So with this research, uh, Jo aims to advance organizational practice so uh, that uh, workplaces are more responsive to people's needs and more embracing of diverse experiences. Uh, as managers, you might also note that uh, adjusting workplaces in such a manner can lead to greater commitment and productivity of your employees. So with this broad area, uh, Joe has conducted prominent and impactful research on menopause. Uh, one part of which currently represents the most comprehensive study on uh, menopause in the workplace. And you would also be interested to know that together with her research team, she wrote um, the commissioned government report called the effects of menopause transition on women's economic participation in the UK. So it is no surprise then that uh, uh, her research attracts so much interest within academic community, but also within uh, a broader world of practice. And we are indeed very fortunate to have her, uh, you know, at the Open University. But, you know, Jo is not only a brilliant academic, uh, as a head of department, she also has a first hand uh, insight into issues surrounding uh, um, menopause, um, uh, you know, at work um, from a managerial uh, man sorry managerial point point of view, but also from the point of view of a woman uh, in transition to menopause herself. Um, and as you know, women's bodily experience, uh, albeit inextricable from her working experiences or any other experiences for that matter, are often overlooked in the process of establishing structures, procedures, practices within organizations. But it would be a mistake to think that this uh, state of affairs uh, um, affects only women in workplaces. It actually inhibits entire organization, uh, its vitality and its productivity. And this is something that Jo will uh, expand on in her presentation. Uh, she will also the cover, cover uh, you know, following three questions that I hope you will uh, be able uh, to kind of have a go at answering yourself because it would be interesting to compare a variety of you. And, and please be free to write your answers in Q&A pane as well. So the first question is, when on average do women attain menopause? What do you think? The second question is, what is the fastest growing group of workers in the UK labor force? And question three, can menopause cause legal difficulties for employees, employers? So without further ado, I will pass you now to Jo. Um, do enjoy and see you in Q&A. Thank Hello, everyone. Could we move on to the first slide, please, Louise? 
Thank you. Thank you all so much for attending today. Um, I know we're all pretty over these sorts of discussions and presentations online, but I'm very pleased to have you all with us today. Um, I should also apologise for my lockdown hair. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are experiencing the same issue. OK, so just to start with a very quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. So first of all, I'm going to give you some key statistics around menopause and talk about some of the key issues in this very normal and natural stage in a woman's life. I'm then going to talk about what myself and my team tend to call the four cases. In other words, the four reasons why menopause is a workplace issue. And that's also the, the four reasons why employers need to take it seriously. I'm going to talk a little bit about how symptoms can affect work and then flip the coin and talk about how work can affect symptoms. In other words, make symptoms worse. And then I'm going to finish up on some recommendations for what employers can do before we move into the Q&A. So on my next slide. These are some key bits of information around menopause. So the, the first thing to say is that for most people, not all, but for most people, it's a midlife experience. So on average, women will attain menopause at 51 and symptoms will begin at 48. It's worth pointing out that those are averages and there's an enormous variety in women's actual experiences of menopause. And also that menopause, strictly speaking, is actually only one day in time because clinically a woman attains menopause on the day which falls 12 months after her last menstrual period. That said, in the transition to menopause or the so-called perimenopause, women will often start experiencing symptoms and symptoms can also continue sometimes for many years into postmenopausal life. I think in general, however, we tend to understand menopause as a later life issue, as something happens to something that happens to older women. Whereas in actual fact, I would argue that's a little bit of a hangover from history. So if we look at the graph to from my right, at least of the screen, you can see that in the early 1900s, on average, women attained menopause at 47. But their life expectancy was in fact only 49. So in, in those days, in that historical period, menopause was actually an end of life experience. But if we fast forward to the 21st century, I've already told you that on average women attain menopause at 51. But our life expectancy now, at least in the global north, is on average 83. So we live typically for three or more decades after we've gone through menopause. And of course, many of those decades will actually spend uh, in paid work. So it's also the case in terms of variations that early menopause, which in clinical terms is menopause before the age of 40, happens to one in 100 women. So that's actually a not uncommon experience. And of course, it's also possible for women to be plunged into what myself and the team tend to call cliff edge menopause, menopause that literally happens overnight, for example, because they have surgery to remove their ovaries or because they start taking things like the breast cancer drug tamoxifen. Symptoms are also extremely varied. So there's, there's again what we tend to call a constellation of symptoms, and these include things like hot flushes and night sweats, anxiety, depression, very erratic and or heavy periods, loss of concentration, problems with memory, low mood, mood swings and urinary incontinence and, and a whole lot more. Um, so again, the particular collection, if you like, of symptoms that a woman experiences will be unique to her. And it's also worth saying that the old adage about some women sailing through menopause is indeed the case. Some women literally almost experience no symptoms at all. That said, the vast majority of women will experience symptoms. And this last point on the slide there is just to illustrate that. So I should first of all explain that the asterisks on women are quite deliberate. So when I use women here or woman, um, it's a placeholder effectively, because I think it's important to remember that anybody who was assigned female at birth, if they haven't gone through certain sorts of surgery, will experience menopause. So that includes a lot of transgender men, and gender non-conforming people. 
that these statistics come from NICE and they show us that 75% of postmenopausal women continue to experience hot flushes, <clears throat> excuse me, and 25% find them bothersome. Now, that's not a word that I particularly like, but it's a word that you find in the clinical literature. And basically it means that these disrupt the quality of their lives. And that includes, of course, at work. So on my next slide. I want to start by saying that the menopause, I think even now, when we've made an enormous amount of progress, particularly in the UK over the last five years of foregrounding the menopause, foregrounding it as normal and natural for the vast majority of women, and also as an important issue in the workplace. That said, I think there is still a lot of sensitivity around the menopause. A lot of people regard it as a private thing, perhaps it's even taboo. And I think that's especially the case in the workplace. And yet there are these four very strong reasons why we need to be paying attention to menopause as menopause, menopause as a workplace issue. And the first of these is straightforward demographics. So in the UK and in fact across the global north, so in places like the United States and Australia and, and a good deal of continental Europe, the fastest growing group of people in these workforces is women aged between 50 and 64, which is of course women who are entering into menopause transition, will attain menopause and then move into postmenopause. So these are the women who typically also will be experiencing perhaps some quite difficult symptoms. And the graph to the right hand side there, or again, at least my right hand side, uh, these are Office for National Statistics data. And what you can see there is that between the last quarter of 1992 and the last quarter of 2020, the percentage rise in women between 50 and 64 in paid work rose by 20.6 points. So that, that's a really dramatic increase in that period of time, which is almost three decades. The equivalent rise for men was much lower. So again, you can see there on the slide that the rise for men was only 11.9. So women in this age band are increasingly coming back to work or indeed staying at work for longer. So again, there's very good demographic reasons for employers to take menopause seriously as a potential workplace issue. So the next slide illustrates what we call the economic case. In other words, some of the things that really can affect, if you like, <clears throat> the organization's bottom line, whether it's actually able to continue being productive. And the first of these is the average cost of recruitment and selection. So if we imagine a menopausal woman who um, actually quits work, and there's quite a lot of evidence that a lot of people consider doing that or indeed do it because of their symptoms. If she does in fact decide to leave her job, then if she earns £25,000 a year, Oxford Economic Statistics tell us that the cost to her employer will be more like £30,614. And that's not just the direct costs of recruitment and selection, it's also all the costs of that woman's knowledge and experience walking out the door of the organisation and the time it takes for a replacement to get up to speed and the extra work that her colleagues might have to do in supporting that replacement until they're fully socialised. It's also worth saying that £25,000 is some way below the UK median salary, which is more like 29 and a half grand, as you can also see on the graph there. So this creates some quite significant direct and indirect economic costs. There's also um, some quite heated debate in academia around whether or not performance dips in midlife per se. So that's for both men and women. Now, there is some evidence that, for example, we lose a little bit of our strength as we get older, we lose some of our cognitive capacity. But then there's also data that counterweighs that around the, the greater experience and knowledge and expertise that we gain as we grow old. <laughs> It's also true to say, however, that if women are experiencing severe hot flushes and night sweats, which are also known as vasomotor, synd vasomotor symptoms, sorry, I've got the wrong set of teeth in today. If they're experiencing those and they're not being supported either medically and or at work, 
but that can create some quite significant economic problems for employers. So there's one estimate that suggests that women who are experiencing these symptoms and finding them very troublesome and difficult, that can have a real impact on their work productivity. In fact, one estimate suggests that women experiencing these symptoms and finding them troubling will lose nearly 60% more productive days at work annually than women who don't have these symptoms. And the extrapolated cost for that worldwide is over $150 billion. That's an extraordinary sum of money. And again, if women aren't supported either medically and or at work, the ONS will tell us that something like 14 million working days were lost in the UK alone in 2018. So there's some very strong, I think, economic arguments for taking menopause seriously. So my next slide moves to the legal case. And menopause, although it's not a protected category in law, it does have protection via the UK Equality Act and also the UK health and safety legislation. And again, that's the case across the global north, although obviously the legislative architecture in each country varies. So, so far in the UK, there have already been three successful employment tribunals brought on the basis of menopause. The first was all the way back in 2012, where a woman called Merchant took British Telecom to court on the basis of unfair dismissal and sex discrimination to do with their menopause symptoms. She had actually been fired on the basis of her symptoms, even though she had a medical note from her GP to say that they were troubling her. She took BT to a tribunal and won. Then more latterly in 2019, a woman called Mandy Davis took all the ironies, her employer's Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to an employment tribunal. Um, and she actually claimed not only on the basis of unfair dismissal, but also disability discrimination because her symptoms were so severe and again, her employer knew about this and these were medically documented that they were actually seen by the tribunal panel to constitute a disability in law. So again, she, she won her case. And then the most recent one was in late 2019. And this is a woman who's anonymized, so she's called A. And she worked for the retail chain Bon Marche. And she actually had to leave work because her manager wouldn't stop teasing and harassing her about her menopausal symptoms. And so she actually took a double claim. She claimed that she'd been subjected to both age and sex related harassment based on her menopausal status and had no choice but to resign as a result. And again, she prevailed at the tribunal. So we've seen cases on the basis of age, cases on the basis of sex, cases on the basis of disability discrimination. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that we will see cases based on gender reassignment around menopause in the future, because that's another protected category in the UK Equality Act. And as I said before, We've had health and safety legislation in this country since the mid 70s that installs or bestows on employers a duty of care for their employees' health and well-being. So again, it's not inconceivable that a case could be brought under the health and safety at work legislation based on menopausal symptoms and a failure of duty of care. So my next slide is the final of the four cases and this is what me and the team tend to call the social responsibility case so this if you like is it's just the right thing to do to actually pay attention to menopause and support midlife working women um, through any of the symptoms that they're finding debilitating so i suggested earlier that there's some quite strong evidence that women who are struggling with their menopausal symptoms either think very seriously about leaving work or indeed leave work altogether. So that pie chart there is based on data for the Centre for Aging Better and again this is very recent data. So they surveyed a very large number of women and of the number of women they surveyed they found, they found that a staggering 370,000 had either thought very seriously about leaving work or had indeed quit altogether because of their menopausal symptoms. And if we put that against the number of working women who are in the menopausal age bracket as of right now, which is about four and a half million, that actually represents quite a significant chunk of that metaphorical pie. So it's something like eight, nine percent of that whole workforce or that whole age group in the workforce. And remembering, of course, that these data only refer to the women that were actually surveyed. 
In terms of social responsibility, it's also really important to bear in mind the gender pay gap, which currently stands at 15.5%. But if we break that gender pay gap down, we can also see that for women in their 50s, they are experiencing a much bigger gender pay gap than their younger or older colleagues. And of course, that coincides completely with the time in which they're probably experiencing menopausal symptoms. The other thing that we need to bear in mind is that the gender pay gap and all sorts of other things affecting women's employment also creates a staggering gender pension gap. And I think this is something that we, we pay much less attention to. So the gender pension gap at the moment, according to Prospect in the UK, is 40.3%. So in other words, on average, women will go into retirement with 43.3% 40 less in their pension pots than their male counterparts. And that's really very worrying. And I, I don't think that the gender pay gap between men and women in their 50s being so wide, you know, that's obviously a very significant contributor to the gender pension gap. Of course, women being able to work for as long as they like, relatively untrammeled by menopausal symptoms, is also a really important part of their financial security. And more than that, it's also a really important source of good mental health, because again, academic studies prove that work is a very important source of social support for women, well, indeed everybody, and also a very important source of self-esteem. So normalising <clears throat> menopause at work, myself and the team feel is simply just the right thing to do. And I've added in brackets there that it pays dividends. And, and what I mean by that is that all of the research that, that we've done as a team, all of the women that we've spoken to in our various presentations and exchanges across the country, all of that information shows very strongly that women respond incredibly positively even to very small adjustments at work around menopause. So that's what I mean about it paying dividends in terms of um, commitment to employer, satisfaction at work and all of those sorts of measures. So on my next slide, Nella very kindly in her very lovely introduction um, referred to us having done uh, what we believe is, is the biggest study of menopause as a workplace issue to date. So this is a survey that we ran in summer 2018 in conjunction with TUC Education in the UK. And we got 5,399 respondents. And at this point, I always have to say, if only there were one more, it was a nice round number. Very, very big survey though. We were absolutely delighted with the number of responses that we got. Um, what you see now is what we tend to call rather sarcastically the top five. So these are the top five symptoms that were identified by respondents to the survey as having a negative impact on work. And it's worth bearing in mind that nearly 73% of respondents to the survey identified as menopausal women. And so you're looking at something like 3,900 3, women responding here. So the, the fifth worst symptom at work uh, was identified as insomnia by 29.5% of those women. Next up, anxiety and worry, identified as a problematic symptom by 31.9%. Focus and concentration, which is absolutely one of my symptoms, identified as problematic by 34.3%. Then hot flushes, identified by 35.1%. But the one that came out on top, in inverted commas, was fatigue, which was identified by 40.3% of these women as a real workplace problem related to menopause. So the next slide actually flips the coin. So I've talked a little bit there about how symptoms can make work more difficult, but there's also quite a lot of data about how work can make symptoms worse. So I've, I've just plopped this particular quotation out of what is now a really large um, collection of data sets that we're working with. So this is an interview that I did with a lady called Elizabeth who works at a hospital trust in Nottinghamshire, and she's in very senior management there. And Elizabeth's talking here about her focus and her memory and how they've been very badly affected by menopause. So she says she finds the cognitive stuff the most challenging. 
She says she pops in to see her boss, who's in an office just across the corridor. He'll ask me a question. And she says she just really struggles to, to conjure up the answer. Or she'll, she'll come out with something random or she'll want to go and check what the answer is. So she says when I get caught on the hoof metaphorically, she feels overwhelmingly that other people think she's useless <clears throat> because they didn't know her before. She's relatively new to the trust when I was interviewing her. And she says, they must think I'm useless and I would have been just so on it before. So she's really struggling with that particular aspect of her menopausal experience. Okay, so on the next slide, we just quick <clears throat> gulp of water. I just wanna finish off on some of the things that employers can do to support midlife workers if they are experiencing <clears throat> difficult menopausal symptoms. And I think it's worth saying actually that we often talk in the team, <clears throat> excuse me, about putting, putting out or creating what we call a cafeteria of different sorts of things in the workplace. So women can pick and choose as to what might be the most beneficial set of arrangements for them, according to their own experiences and according to their own constellation of symptoms. But the first thing to say, and this is absolutely vital, is that a woman should always make up her own mind and be able to make up her own mind about whether she tells anybody at work that she's having difficult menopausal symptoms. There is a lot of evidence still that some women simply prefer to deal with it as a private and personal matter. They don't think it's any business of their line manager or their colleagues or the, the employer per se. So there should never be any form of coercion or persuasion for women to disclose symptoms. However, employers should be making what the law calls reasonable adjustments. Now, this is something that we tend to think of in the context of disability. But actually, I think it's a good phrase to use um, across the board in supporting menopause for women. And it's important to say, of course, that menopause is not a disability, although it can be disabling in terms of the symptoms that it causes. So these reasonable adjustments are just things, they're tweaks and alterations in the organisational landscape, some very cheap and very easy, others, fair enough, much more expensive and much more complex, but that actually level the playing field, if you like. So one choice for organisations to make if, if they want to enter into this particular space, and I would really recommend that they do, is whether they would like a menopause policy, whether they would like something more informal like guidance, or whether they really would just prefer to share information about the menopause and, and let members of the organisation decide how best to respond. However, it is absolutely vital that any move towards making the workplace more menopause friendly is underpinned by a, a shift in organisational culture and that has to start with awareness raising. It has to start with making everybody in that workplace aware of what the menopause is, busting some of the myths and taboos around it and suggesting some of the issues that it can cause for women going through it. So this is part of the ongoing process, we would argue, of normalising the menopause, of making it as uncontroversial as conversations about pregnancy leave or maternity leave. We believe that line managers especially need to be trained, so they need to be very aware of menopause as an EDI issue, as an occupational health issue potentially, but they also need to be trained in listening and having what could be quite sensitive and difficult conversations with their female staff. In larger organisations in particular, we would recommend that occupational health advisors are fully trained and fully aware around menopause, as are any other specialist providers. So anyone who's providing an employee assistance programme, for example. Ideally, we'd like to see absence policies tailored so that repeated short absences due to menopause are classified as a, as a sickness issue or an ill health issue, as opposed to something that triggers performance management procedures. Informal support is absolutely invaluable. So for example, menopause cafes, we've also seen a lot of yammer groups set up in organisations across the UK, but there's one at the OU and it's incredibly active and it's a really lovely, vibrant space for women to share their experiences, ask for advice, give other people recommendations. 
flexible working arrangements. So, for example, if a woman is suffering from very bad menopause-related insomnia, perhaps she could start her working day later and finish later. Of course, we're all working from home at the moment anywhere, or at least the vast majority of us are working from home. But that could also be part of the provision in normal, normal non-pandemic times. And it is worth bearing in mind, of course, that anybody in the UK who has worked for the same employer for more than six months has a right to request flexible work. That doesn't mean the employer necessarily needs to give them the flexi work that they're asking for, but they certainly have the entitlement to request it. Um, home working support as well. And of course, the pandemic is really relevant here. So I think we, we have to be very careful not to assume that working from home will necessarily be beneficial for menopausal women. Of course, you know, it might be easier to wear cooler clothes. They should have access to um, heat control so they can turn the heat up or down in, in their house according to um, their particular temperature at any given time. They've got access to cold drinking water and so on. But it may also, the home may also be a very stressful place for a number of different reasons, um, not least of which is simply poor Wi-Fi. But we've also got childcare issues. There may be domestic abuse going on. And if you put menopause on top of that, that can actually make the work at uh, working from a real, real challenge. OK, so the next slide. And in fact, pretty much the last of what I've got to say are talking about environmental adjustments. Um, so these are things about the physical context of work. So providing fans, something as small as a USB desk fan, and or good ventilation so women can open windows or sit near windows um, if they're experiencing hot flushes, temperature control, clean, comfortable and well-equipped toilets for things like menstrual flooding, cold drinking water, lighter layered non-synthetic workwear. We're seeing quite a lot of police forces, for example, now introducing breathable uniforms, which of course doesn't just benefit <clears throat> menopausal women, it also benefits anybody who works up a bit of a sweat at work or indeed cycles to work. Rest areas, so women can take brief timeouts during the working day. Natural light has been shown to ameliorate menopausal symptoms. Access to showers if possible and reduction of noise exposure. Um, there's a, a very interesting study of nursery school teachers in France, which shows that one of the big stressors and one of the big exacerbators of menopausal symptoms is noise. Now, clearly, it's a bit difficult to ameliorate noise in a kindergarten class, but we could think about ways to ameliorate noise exposure in other workplaces. OK, so that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. On the next slide. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, there are some. Oh, sorry. Can we go back one? <laughs> There are some resources. Um, so the first, third and fourth are all freely available. You can simply click on them and, 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 and read and, and dig around. Um, I, I would thoroughly recommend Hempick Menopause in the Workplace. We've been working with them for several years now and they really are state of the art in terms of the support that they can give to employers who want to become more menopause friendly. OK. That's it. I think we are now ready for Q and A. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joe, for Joe this thought-provoking uh, presentation. presentation. I apologize, I apologize. My, my my voice, voice is, is coming back, back to me. So, 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 so can, you, can you, Joe? Can I ask you, Joe, to Joe please to, uh, to mute your mic for just yes, a few seconds? Sure. Yep. Ah, oh, that's far better. Um, Gosh, does everybody ha hate their, their own voices? Uh, um, I know I do mine. So we had uh, some, some amazing uh, uh, comments here um, in relation to your presentation. And uh, the one that uh, people voted for the most is uh, the one from Liz, who says that uh, figures uh, relating to uh, that you presented uh, uh, about menopause in workplace are interesting when you consider that uh, 50 plus women are also seen by recruiters as the least desirable demographic and first choice for redundancy. And um, I wonder in relation to, to that, how much attention do workplaces in the UK 
currently give to this important issue of, of menopause in comparison perhaps to other countries? Um, like, is there, a, is there a good role model uh, to follow or is this our chance to champion some of these issues at workplace? And thanks, Liz, for pointing that out. I think that's absolutely right. I think we, we are still facing rampant gendered ageism in this country and across, across the global north. That said, I will say that in the last, so I've been working on this project and in this area for, goodness me, five years now. That's flown by. And I have seen a, a massive and very significant uptick in employers in this country, in all economic sectors and across all of um, all different sorts of, um, so in public, private and third sector, and also in different industry sectors. So education, the police, retail, utilities, financial services, the list goes on. There are a lot particularly of big employers now taking menopause very seriously and really blazing a trail for other employers to follow. So, um, for example, uh, if I was to reference some of the organisations that Hempic have supported, numerous universities, Aviva, there's also work going on at Santander in the financial sector, um, numerous police services, um, Marks and Spencers have done some work in this space, Sainsbury's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that at the moment, the UK is actually providing a very good role model for practice in other countries and certainly when I talk to friends and colleagues in continental Europe and in the States and in Australia things are much further behind there. Having said that I still think we are behind the curve and what we need to do is get organisations, my belief, small ambition, um, to completely normalise menopause at work in, in the next four or five years so that, as I say, it becomes no more remarkable a topic of conversation than discussion about how long a woman's going to be on maternity leave for and, and when she wants to come back to work. Thank you, Joe. Uh, another very, very interesting question from Clam. How do you change organisational culture especially in male dominated industries to be more aware of menopause and I, I, uh, I guess in relation to that if I may add like, can organizations contribute to dismantling the social stigma attached to menopause? Um, I think the answer to the second question is absolutely um, and Clem I think that's a really interesting question because again and you, this won't be any surprise um, especially to you <laughs> personally um, that some of the biggest kind of reports, if you like, of um, problematic treatment at work or feeling unable to disclose come from women who work in what you might call male dominated or, or very masculine environments. So environments like the police, environments like the army, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's also in some of those workplaces and the police services it's the best example where, where the most um, work has been done. So in this country, the first police service to have a menopause policy was Nottinghamshire. And um, we're going back now probably five or six years for that. And if you were to look at all the other police services across the country who followed suit, you know, the numbers really are quite significant. That said, it's absolutely fine to have a policy and have all sorts of you know this cafeteria of arrangements that I was talking about earlier um, but what really needs to change and I think this is what Clem's question goes to are people's attitudes and what we found in doing doing the work that we do and our collaborations with Pempic is that as, as, a, as a very old and sorry a, a former not very old a former and dearly beloved boss of mine back in the day used to say the only way around it is through it um, the piece that we published in Occupational Health at Work actually talked quite a lot again about the four cases that I've just introduced you to, but also about some of the ways in which these discussions can be had in workplaces and start to change people's mindsets and attitudes without necessarily putting people on the spot. So one of the examples I like was um, from I think it was Seven Trent Water. Um, and they were a very early mover in this space, one of the first utility companies to actually move into this, this particular arena. And what they did to kick their 
menopause campaign off was they got people to send in questions anonymously so they could simply post to a particular website they could name themselves if they wanted to but they didn't have to and what that meant was that when the questions were answered however kind of daft the questioners may have thought they were they they didn't have the embarrassment of having to raise their hand or identify themselves in public and there are various other things i think that, that you can do so another good example i think is bringing in what you might call neutral brokers. So I think this is where Hempicked do so well because when their trainers and advisors go into workplaces, they are neutral brokers. If, if you like, they have no skin in the game. They're not employees at that particular organization. Um, but I think it's also really important that each organization does what works for that organization. It's important Menopause support isn't one size fits all. And in some organisations, some things will work much better than in others. So I think it's important to bear that in mind as well. Lovely. Thank you, Joe. Um, a very, very interesting question from Michelle Gleason. Has research shown that women's well-being has improved when changes have made have been made in the workplace? Uh, she said that as a woman business owner, um, and in charge of uh, her own work day, she found it all horrendous and nothing helped. And and I I suppose uh, I can uh, attach another question to to that question too. Um, so how detailed an understanding of menopausal symptoms does our medical community have? Uh, considering you said that menopause is still taboo, seldom talk uh, talked about openly. So is there a finite uh, uh, list of symptoms out there? Okay, so that, that's a, a lovely collection of questions. Michelle, I'm so sorry you're having such a hard time. Um, I think what I'm going to start with is the medical question and then I'll flip back to Michelle's question if that's all right. So the usual understanding is that there is something like 34 symptoms of menopause. That said, there's still quite a lot of clinical disagreement as to what constitutes a symptom. Because in some cases, um, there's arguments about what's known as the domino effect. So the domino effect to illustrate is, am I tired because I'm menopausal? Or am I tired because I'm having night sweats because I'm menopausal? So, you know, the direct correlation between fluctuating hormone levels and particular symptoms is still a matter of debate in the medical community. I think it's also true to say that general practitioners in particular in this country receive very little training in menopause and unfortunately our anecdotal evidence tells us that they can be quite dismissive of symptoms um, or they refuse to prescribe HRT because they've, they've misunderstood some of the medical evidence around HRT or indeed they prescribe it but they say they'll only prescribe it for a very short time so there is a big job of work to be done um, by organisations like the British Medical Society and the Royal Society for Medicine and indeed the BMA of actually educating general practitioners about, again, this very normal and natural stage in a woman's life. But Michelle particularly asked a question about workplace interventions. Now, it, it, that's a really interesting question because the answer is where there is evidence, absolutely yes, it improves women's well-being. The problem is that the evidence base is really quite small. So at the moment, I think if I was to, to enumerate the number of studies that I'm aware of, one of which I wrote, which is a, a confidential report for the hospitals post I was talking about earlier, I think we've probably got maybe seven or eight studies. Um, so there's a couple that were done in Japan, a couple that were done in Finland, some that were done in the UK. Another one I read very recently was done in the Netherlands. But this is a very, very small data set, if you like. That said, the anecdotal evidence that I hear from women when I, when I go out and chat to them or, or I'm in an email exchange with them is that their employer simply putting it on the agenda has a real effect on their health and well-being, as I said when I was talking about the social responsibility case. So simply put, we need a lot more academic research in that area of workplace intervention. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Um, a very specific question from uh, Caroline. Do you know of any research on how the menopause can affect fitness levels? Thinking of the police and armed forces uh, here, and you mentioned 
something uh, uh, about uniforms, breathable uniforms and all that. So perhaps you encountered some of these studies? Yeah, again, um, a very interesting question. There is some what I would call experimental research, so like laboratory experiments where they're testing things um, like physical fitness, but also cognitive capacity in a laboratory environment. So, so what they're doing there is simulating what might go on in a workplace and seeing how well women cope with it. Um, and that would be particularly the research that I'm thinking of is about women who have very physical flushes. So does does a hot flush affect your your physical capacity or, or indeed your your cognitive capacity? Um, I'm not aware off the top of my head of particular studies being done in places like, you know, in workforces like the army or, or indeed um, the police service. But I think you could extrapolate across some of those experimental studies to, to draw conclusions. I would though say that I think experimental studies are very useful, are also only ever simulations. So they only ever tell us about how a particular woman might perform in a lab environment. And I think it's it's an ongoing question as, as to how much that would map over into the, the, the actual workplace. Uh, thanks, Joe. A really nice comment from Catherine O'Keefe. Uh, she says progress is being made here in Ireland in workplaces, not as progressed as the UK, but headway is being made. And I'm finding more workplaces opening this conversation. And it's really uh, good to hear that. And uh, from their neighbour uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, Lisa said, Hi, I was wondering if it would be proactive to encourage women who are having long term uh, disabling effects caused by the menopause to apply for PIP. And I uh, suggest PIP is a performance improvement plan. I hope I got it right. Yes, I think that's what it stands for. Um, that's a really good question, Lisa. I'm going to have to think about that one for a couple of minutes. Um, I suppose my, why I'm being a little bit hesitant is that to me, when you get into performance management, um, it should be used when low performance or reduced performance is something that is the employee's fault, if that makes sense. Um, so for example, if they're continually late for work because they can't get out of bed, um, or they're taking a lot of Fridays and Mondays because they want long weekends as opposed to actually being episodes of sickness. That sort of thing, I think, is, is absolutely where performance management or performance intervention or import performance improvement, whatever you might want to call it, can work. I'm a little bit concerned about women getting themselves into that space because I think really it's I suppose I'm just going to say it out loud. I think it's an employer's obligation, morally, legally, et cetera, to actually provide the appropriate support. Um, so if a woman is struggling with her menopausal symptoms because the way that her work is set up or the physical environment she works in, the uniform she has to wear, whatever it might be, is, is reducing her performance, then I think those are things that the employer can change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Joe, just to interrupt, I just got a message from uh, from Lisa uh, where she clarifies that she meant personal independence payment. Uh, these acronyms, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's an old DLA disability living allowance. Yeah, um, yeah. that's a uh, really, again, sorry, I went completely off at a tangent there, forgive me. I led you there. Um, yeah, I, uh, sorry. The honest answer, Michelle, Michelle, so now I'm calling you the wrong name. Lisa is I don't know and that's I, I'm not um, particularly well up on the so-called benefit system I, I hate that word um, so I think that is something that I would want to explore with an expert rather than me gaily saying yes you, you could apply for PIP I, I, I really don't know if I'm honest uh, thanks Joe um you know, speaking, uh, uh, mentioning issues uh, uh, in Northern Ireland and uh, Ireland uh, prompted me to think about 
the UK and, and our relationship to the uh, EU after Brexit. And uh, I'm wondering, do you envisage Brexit impacting on, on this issue at all? And, you know, if yes, how? Yeah, I, I, I'm actually really worried about Brexit. I mean, I'll, I'll say it out loud, I'm a Remainer. I find the whole Brexit thing just baffling, really. Um, <clears throat> in terms of menopause work, or menopause in general, actually, I, I, I think there are two key issues here. So the first one we're actually already experiencing, and this has been going on for some time. Um, one of the um, forms of prescription for HRT um, is a patch, and it's often called the dual or the combined patch because it has both oestrogen and progesterone in it. And it's something that anecdotally I've spoken to a lot of women who, who found it's really helped them doesn't help everybody and you know obviously there are side effects and so on but for a lot of women it has been a, a, a literal game changer. Now the supply of that product um, was already fairly variable and I hope I'm right in saying that it's manufactured outside of the UK. I think it's manufactured in continental Europe so there were already supply issues before Brexit. And it worries me greatly that those supply issues will probably be exacerbated now that the UK has left the European Union. Um, the other thing that also worries me, and, and this is perhaps more germane to the workplace in particular, is what we hear this phrase, a bonfire of workers' rights, as a result of us leaving Brexit and of leaving Brexit, leaving the EU, and of course no longer having to be beholden to things like the fair human rights legislation. And, and that really scares me. It, it really scares me that, that, that our current government, because of their political coloration, because of their dislike for regulation, because of their belief in a small state, I could go on, but I'd probably start swearing, um, that they are going to roll back, in some cases, decades of employment protection. And if they do that, I think that has real clear and present dangers for menopausal women, as well as pretty much everybody who exists in the world and, and leaves their house on occasion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Something to uh, keep an eye on and, and um, you know, um, research in the future for sure. Um, we have another uh, questions around uh, the training that, uh, you know, may be given within organization on menopause. So have you had any conversations with managers around what specific training they would like to be given around supporting or, or having a conversation with a colleague going through the menopause? Um, I think you're muted, uh, Joe. sorry. I am, sorry, you think I'd, I'd have the hang of this after nearly a year. Um, I have had conversations um, primarily in my data gathering with women who are experiencing menopausal symptoms. That said, some of them are managers as well. Um, I think the best way to answer that is actually to say that there was a really interesting study done by Claire Hardy at Lancaster, uh, Amanda Griffiths at Nottingham and Myra Hunter, who's at King's in London. And what they did was they put together a very short, so only 30 minutes, um, online learning tool for managers and they trialled it with a group of managers and the results were incredibly positive. So there is evidence that managerial training can, can make an awful lot of difference and I, I suppose although it, it, that's not something that I personally have done a lot of investigation into, I, I feel that one of the things that really does help, not just line managers, but everybody who works in an organisation, because, you know, we all know midlife women. Uh, we all work, live, are friendly with, et cetera, midlife women. Um, I just feel that awareness raising and myth busting goes a hell of a long way. I think that there's a lot of um, confusion about menopause out there. There's a lot of what lovely Donald Trump would call fake news. Um, that, that worries me because actually I think when, when we're all aware and educated about menopause, it, it comes to seem much more normal and, and we can get rid of some of these horror stories that, that seem to be circulating. So I would always start with awareness, awareness raising for managers. I would also make sure that they are aware of legislative issues and of course I think, and again this is borne out by research, um, training and having difficult conversations. 
particularly I think for younger women or, or male line managers, it can be tricky to have those sorts of conversations. So I think it, it's those sorts of training packages I would recommend. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm. I think we have uh, the time left only for one yeah. questions uh, question uh, before we will have to uh, close this this session. So uh, Anna asked that carrying on from Liz's questions, if we push for more work on menopause, do you think that employment uh, of women over fifty will become even more difficult, even more stigmatized? Yeah. Again, I mean. That's that's a question that we get asked a lot. Um, we, we we do get some pushback um, from <clears throat> excuse me from women, and quite understandably, um, the argument being that you know this could be just another stick to beat us with, and I absolutely hear that argument. But I suppose again, in the spirit of the only way around it is through it. I suppose I'd ask everybody who's who's old enough. I am. Um, to cast their minds back to when um, workplaces really didn't understand pregnancy or maternity. I'm not saying that we have it right in this country around pregnancy and maternity, but I think pretty much everybody knows that those enjoy legal protection and it is incumbent on employers to treat women who are going through that particular reproductive life stage properly, decently and equally. And I simply feel that we've just got to keep pushing on this menopause issue. I agree that we don't want to fuel employers' prejudices. That said, I think quite a lot of the work that we do and that we want to see done is actually about dismantling those prejudices rather than fueling them, if that makes sense. Thank you ever so much, Joe. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have left uh, in this se session, uh, but thank you all for the thought provoking questions. They made for a really, really robust uh, discussion. And uh, to those people whose questions Joe did not uh, get to answer here, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, rest assured she will make sure to consider them in, in the coming days and send you her responses. I should also say that, uh, uh, you know, to those who inquired that uh, both slides and video uh, of this session will be available in the coming days uh, as well. Uh, and finally, uh, please stay tuned for the upcoming GOP events on our Business School's Twitter account and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.